that used classical motifs and tropes that were meant to really push an agenda about morality. So in some ways it's history painting, but really classical history painting, not current events the way the British were doing it in their paintings. Jacques-Louis David is the main proponent for this style. And he is really a giant in French painting who is following in the footsteps of Nicolas Poussin, who we studied earlier when we were looking at the Rococo lecture. And remember, I told you that Poussin is actually a Baroque painter who studied in Italy, and he's not Rococo. So Jacques-Louis David is related to a Rococo painter. I think it was either Boucher or Fragonard. You'll have to check that fact. And he advocates a new style of painting that probably coincides a lot with some of the ideas that come up in the social contract by Jean-Jacques Rousseau. So for my class, you actually have to know the ideas for Jean-Jacques Rousseau's social contract and we read excerpts out of it. And it would help you if you actually just looked it up in an encyclopedia because it's a really important seminal work of art, uh, of uh, literature and philosophy. The painting The Oath of the Horatii is a painting that was painted about five or six years before the French Revolution. And this painting can be seen as almost a call to arms that led to some of the events of the French Revolution. Its massive size really is almost as if you're looking at a movie screen. And the figures are near life size, which would be very persuasive. In terms of its physical form, the composition, the lighting, way that the, the arrangement of the figures in it, it really recalls in some ways classical relief sculpture from the Arapacus Auguste from Rome, and also some classical relief sculpture that we saw, for instance, from the Panathenae procession uh, from about 450 BCE in ancient Athens. The figures are all against the front of the picture plane, and the background is really uh, an extra. It's not really very important in some ways. However, I think that what David is doing is he creates the background, those three arches, which are sort of referencing the iconography of a symbolic triumphal arch, frame the three sorts of figures or groupings that are in the picture. There's a strong raking light that's coming from the left-hand side that creates a lot of volume and, and uh, really pushes the, the figures out and shows us a lot of deep space in some ways and carves the figures out of light in a way, which also references sculpture. And the use of classical uh, architecture also does this as well. The use of perspective on the column tops and on the masonry on the walls also brings our focus to this X created by the hand and the swords in the center of the picture. And so those kinds of things really focus your attention on what's the most important thing. And there's even a sort of diagonal created by the height of the figures down into the women in the, in the lower right hand corner, as if you're sort of flowing down from the three men who are swearing an oath on the sword and moving down the picture plane into the women in the background. There's some really neat stuff going on in terms of how this is painted as well. And I think that it'll relate to something that we're going to study later on. There's an article by a woman named Linda Nothlin called The Imaginary Orient that discusses how sometimes the realer something looks, the more realistic something is, the more you believe in its truth. And if you look at this painting by Jacques-Louis David, all of the textures, the masonry, figures, the drapery, even the flesh and the anatomy are so realistic that it almost feels like a documentary kind of image that's meant to depict something that really happened. The story that's being depicted is also a really important story that will, I think it's a catalyst for the French Revolution. 
these three brothers, the sons of Horatius, or Horatio, I think it's Horatius, um, are swearing on their swords to go fight three brothers who are from another senatorial family over the control of Rome. It's kind of a story a little bit like David and Goliath. And what I'm talking about in particular is that the story is that these three brothers are making an oath to go fight the three brothers that their sisters, so Horatius's um, sisters, uh, these three guys on the left-hand side, their sisters are on the right-hand side, and the mother is also on the right-hand side. And they're going to fight to determine who gets control over Rome, more or less. And in the process of, do process of doing so, they'll either die, uh, or they will achieve honor. So it's death before dishonor, kind of like the Marines. And they're swearing on this sword, and I think that it's pretty clear that David was making those swords look almost like a crucifix, that they were swearing on the swords of the crucifix. And sort of the message behind this then is that they are swearing an oath to the state that they will die uh, in honor of the state. And it almost has a sort of semi-religious moralizing thing where it would be really important to give up your life for something you believe in and for something that has a higher moral stance. And part of what is probably going on here is this idea that they're referring in some ways to all the abuses that happened in Versailles, especially by Louis and how the ruler has broken the social contract and that the people who are the citizens of the state need to do something to bring it back to an earlier period in which there is a more patriotic attitude on the part of everyone involved in the government. So this probably reflects some of the ideas in Jean-Jacques Rousseau's social contract. I think a quick comparison of Jacques-Louis David's Oath of the Horatii against the pilgrimage to the island of Scythera by Watteau, who's a Rococo painter, will really kind of point this out. Neoclassicism. Neo means new, classicism means classic. So it's a new sort of angle on classicism that Jacques-Louis David is advocating. If we look at the Rococo angle on classicism by Watteau, it's loose, it's fluffy, it's got a lot of bro broken brushwork in it. The uh, way that it's painted uses a lot of pastels. There are saturated colors, but they're more pastel than the saturated colors that are in the Oath of the Horatii. And some of the actual way in which the Oath of the Horatii is painted, where it, there are no brushstrokes evidenced. You can't see any of the technique that was made to make it. Now, I know photography really doesn't come around until the 1850s, more or less, when it becomes really, really mainstream. But this is long before photography, and this guy is painting in an almost photorealistic style. Whereas Watteau is painting in a loose, kind of brushy style. And then if we look at the themes, Watteau is painting basically a scene of aristocrats who are making reference to classical things, but it's the goddess of love, right? It's not really a moralizing content. It's really just about all these aristocrats going out to have a fun time on the Isle of Scythera and to make love in the afternoon. Whereas in The Oath of the Horatii, it's hardcore, it's real. The idea is that it's not a uh, diminished sense of morality. David is on hand <laughs> to uh, attend to a meeting of the three estates, and it's kind of a complex issue, but I'll try to summarize it very quickly for you here. The events that led up to the French Revolution really start um, as early, really in the, in the 1780s, in the early part of the decade, when the French bourgeoisie, who are part of what's called the Third Estate, are approaching the government and saying, hey, there's a lot of really bad stuff going on in, in France at this time. And we really are seeing a lot of people who are starving and a lot of poor stuff. And the government is not being a good parent to its citizens. And 
Probably the thing that they took the most offense to and had the most issue with was some of the tax laws and some of the ways in which the aristocracy, which was considered the first estate, was abusing the third estate. And the third estate is made up of, of course, peasants, but a rising class of people that we referred to earlier in the Chardin lecture as the bourgeoisie are these middle class, very wealthy people who are making money by having shops and by having factories and producing commodities. And in the years before this, this, this sort of rising class, class of the middle class, the bourgeois, were buying aristocratic titles and were trying to elevate their own status, but a lot of them were still kind of unhappy with this. So all of this sort of bubbles up into a meeting that was called the king finally agrees to have a meeting of the three estates, in which the first estate, which is the aristocracy, the second estate, which is the clergy, and the third estate are supposed to meet at the, uh, the Louvre, more or less, and have a meeting and discuss politics and what they can do to help ease the burden of probably the middle class, but that's not what probably the aristocracy thought was for. The problem was that the first and second estates came in filled up all the seats in the room and then they closed the doors and then the third estate couldn't get into the meeting. So the bourgeoisie couldn't get into the meeting so they went and met at, at a tennis court, which was the largest space that they could find where they could gather. And they swore an oath that they would solve some of the problems and this is called the oath of the tennis court and they would meet uh, whenever they could and by whatever means they could to, to sort of fix the French government. This was the first sort of catalyst to what happens in 1789 to the French Revolution. Now, if you look at this painting, it's actually a drawing from 1791. David was on hand there to draw it, um, but it's actually not a drawing that was made there. Unfortunately, David, um, who was more or less sort of the pageant master of the French Revolution, was this guy who was commissioned to make a drawing documenting it, but the cast of characters, some of them you may know, uh, Marat, Robespierre um, are, are some of the characters who were Danton uh, that were responsible in the French terror that happens after 1789 where people are just guillotined all over the place and there's a lot of death. So he never finished the painting because he didn't know who he should put in the painting. And so this is just a preliminary sketch. So the French Revolution happens in 1789 and um, they march to Versailles and kill the king and the queen behead them in the guillotine and then there are what, what a bunch of kangaroo courts like sort of courts in which literally thousands of people were killed sometimes uh, in a day you know where hundreds of people were killed and people would actually sit out on the court and watch the guillotine uh, kill people and they would hunt down aristocrats and royalist sympathizers and people who were peasants and, and bourgeoisie who disagreed with the mission of what was going on in the French Revolution. Uh, a good novel to, to get a sort of overview of it, although it's very romanticized, is The Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. It's really an interesting phase in history, and one of the things that happens in it is a couple of people seize power and are responsible for some really terrible atrocities. And one of the guys who is, in my opinion, so, his name is Marat, and, and we see a portrait of him here as if he is someone who is beautiful and a martyr. So it just depends on your point of view of the events that happened during the French Revolution. Marat is this guy who basically signed a ton of death warrants for people and was responsible for leading to the death of a lot of people who uh, were involved in the French Revolution and also, of course, aristocrats. He was also this guy who had a terrible, terrible skin disease. I think it was a sort of a scrofulous, uh, you, know, um, you know, skin disease where he basically, it was either eczema or something like that, where he basically had a lot of discomfort. And he found that the only way he could be comfortable was to bathe himself, was to soak in the bath. And so we have a picture of this guy sitting in a bathtub with a board over the top that he would have used as a desk. And this was pretty well known, I think, at the time, um, at least among that crew, and David would have known this. At one point, he's in the bath, and um, this young royalist sympathizer named Charlotte Corday comes in and says, I can help you locate some people who are enemies of the state. 
And so she is ushered into the bathtub and he starts writing out their death warrant. And she says, no, it's gonna be you who dies. And she stabs him. And so we have this picture of Marat in the bathtub stabbed for his troubles for writing the death warrant. Now, whichever way you agree, whether you think Marat was a hero or not, David did. And David saw himself uh, as the sort of propagandist for the French Revolution. He was going to make sure that he documented the death of Marat and made him look like a hero. So how does he do that? Well, clearly you can see he's painting it in that hard-edged, very real style that's not very painterly. The background is actually painted in a very loose, brushy way. And the painting, you could consider it kind of unfinished because of that. As you look closer at some of the figures in the painting, you can actually see that Marat has a sort of beautific expression on his face. He has his desk laying there. It also has on the note the specifics of how he was killed by Charlotte Corday. We have a little wound that's not very bloody and not very intense. The, the bath water is stained red, but it's really a minor element. We have this strong breaking light moving down on his figure. He's kind of got this turban on that, uh, that sort of makes him in some ways look Middle Eastern, uh, at least in the eyes of the French at the time. And he's got fairly heroic musculature. He's, you know, he's kind of got some big muscles, which makes him look a little bit like a hero. His arm falls out of the tub, and down at the base, we see the knife, and we see uh, the feathered quill in which he was writing things. And if you ever get this wrong on a test, there's something severely wrong with you, right? because the signature and the title of the painting are right there for you. The overall arrangement of the painting is basically all this empty space at the top is pushing down on the figure and we also see that the gradation of tone in the background creates a strong diagonal. So in a way, he has created a painting that makes Marat look like an angelic or beautific creature, sort of in a Jesus-like way. And so he is considered a, de uh, a death that is a martyrdom for the French state. David really is responsible for advocating a style, and when, when the French Revolution comes along, he actually takes over the Louvre, and actually takes over the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, well, not the Louvre, but the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, which is a school of beautiful arts. And uh, the Louvre, I think, is at that point, you need to check the facts on this, is transformed into a museum for the French government. In any event, <clears throat> his style of painting, this neoclassical style, sort of leaks out across the world and becomes the popular style, even in England and in the United States, to depict sort of uh, democratic and Republican ideals. A republic is just basically kind of a democracy that's run by a, a series of, of senates and, uh, and, and people who are representing, representing the people. So, David, a couple years before the French Revolution, death of Socrates, Socrates is a martyr and he is dying for a greater cause. And we have the finger pointing up, we have him about to drink his hemlock, we have got that freeze-like design, we've got our strong breaking light, and the figure of Socrates, he's got the body of a 20-year-old guy, which represents his beauty insight, and he's got the beard of a philosopher. So this is taken up again in the United States. <laughs> Horatio Greena is um, basically making a portrait of George Washington using the same kinds of symbols, the same kinds of formal elements. Uh, George here has uh, the body of a, uh, of a 20 year old uh, athlete. Uh, he's offering a sword and he's making the gesture that we've seen so often, which is pointing up towards the heavens and about the idea of a higher ideal. We've seen this gesture over and over again, and it's gonna continue as a sort of uh, motif or a symbol that artists reuse and use and use over and over again. So in this way, the neoclassical style is kind of like the Renaissance style. It's a rebirth of classical ideas and using classicism for classier reasons rather than what we saw before, which was, for instance, in the Rococo period, classicism was a disguise for sort of unclassy activities uh, that were of more sensuous nature and uh, more hedonistic in general. 
So in England, there was a young Swiss woman <laughs> who was uh, basically sort of brought to England by a duchess and her name is Angelica Kaufman. And she was championed in England as being a very entertaining, interesting young woman. And she became a very famous painter in England at that point in time. And so we're gonna talk about Angelica Kaufman. Angelica Kaufman is basically taking the vocabulary of neoclassicism and filtering it a little bit through the ideas of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Some of the ideas in some of Rousseau's writings have to do with the roles of good citizens in society. And so one of the roles that he seems to advocate, and uh, my teachers called it the myth of the, uh, of the happy mother. The myth of the happy mother is this idea that women, their role, according to Rousseau, in society is to basically have lots of children and to be good mothers. And so she is taking her understanding of classicism and translating it into a story in the same sorts of uh, ways that David did. So for instance, these figures are all arranged in a phrase, like again, the Panathenaic procession, but they're also just depicting children and women. So in some ways, it's actually closer in, in meaning to, for instance, the Arapacus Auguste that was in ancient Rome, the, the altar to the Roman peace. But Angelica Kaufman, or Angelica, this is really how it's supposed to be pronounced, is also making reference to a tradition that we have looked at before that's evidenced by the Stele of Hegeso. The Stele of Hegeso is actually a sculpture from the classical age of Greece that's contemporary with the building of the Parthenon. And it depicts a young, beautiful woman on her gravestone, and a maid is bringing in a box of jewelry to her, and she is li she is looking at her jewels. And so what is kind of being said here is that women, in some ways, especially noble aristocratic, aristocratic women, that's what they're interested in, jewelry. And this would have been a young woman who was ornamenting herself. Well, I think in the neoclassical period, they didn't want to think that. Uh, about women, or they did, uh, and were trying to re-educate them. Actually, there's one story about Jacques David actually asking his wife for her jewelry to contribute it to the French Revolution, and, and they do that. So this painting on the left-hand side is a, is a real reference to that. Even if you look at the face on the figure of the far-right figure who's showing you her jewelry, not only is her pose very similar, but even the way the nose is designed, that flat nose that runs straight into the forehead, which is a Greek nose, they're quoting Stelia Pegasa, but they're doing a correction on the scene. So what Kaufman is saying is the story of, of uh, Cornelia, who's the mother of the great geek, who basically decides that she is going to do something really good um, by, 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 by believing in the future in her children. And what her, her belief in the future is this. Uh, this, she is visiting a friend of hers, her friend shows her her jewels, and she says, uh, Cornelia, where are your jewels? And Cornelia says, uh, these are my jewels, and she indicates her children. So this is an attitude or a way of, of sort of discussing the role of women in society and sort of educating the English, because this is really was painted in England at the time. I thought it would be important to just show you this por portrait of Madame Recamier because it's, it's painted after the French Revolution, I think when Napoleon has come to power, and the depiction of Madame Recamier, who was basically sort of connected with the salons before the French Revolution. She fled to England for a while and then came back with her husband to France and tried to reestablish her reputation. She's being shown in a neoclassical way. This painting is unfinished, the background is unfinished, but uh, some cool little things are the clothing that she's wearing is very similar to some of the clothing that you would imagine people wearing in Jane Austen novels. Uh, it's, she's also reclining on what we call now a Recamier couch, uh, because it's named after this painting, and she has a Roman urn on the left-hand side. And there was actually a sort of fashion of wearing drapery that was supposed to look 
like classical clothes and sometimes even the women would wet the drapery down to make it wet drapery with perfume and oils and things like that so that it would cling to the body and it would look a little bit more like some of the relief sculpture that was from ancient Greece. Another thing that sort of is influencing some of this stuff at this point in time is that they're starting to excavate Pompeii. And so Pompeii, uh, if you go back and you look at, for my lecture on Pompeii, you'll see that Pompeii was basically this city on in Italy that was sealed up by volcanic ash and they started figuring out how to excavate at this point in time. So there was a real craze for classicism at this point in time. The interest in classicism even continues further on in, uh, in France and this building sort of predates the French Revolution. It was started out as a church and it evolves into um, uh, basically a civic building because of the French Revolution. And uh, so Jacques uh, Germain Soufflot makes this building and they name it the Pantheon. And it was started as the Church of Saint Jean Vier, Saint Genevieve. Um, and then it was later on converted into a structure that uh, basically houses the remains of important French citizens. And so it does look like the Pantheon, but it looks like a Pantheon is seen through the school of art in France that had sort of begun as the Ecole de Beaux Arts in French history in the 1700s and then is taken over by Jacques Louis David. So the classicizing trend that David is, is bringing forth in painting always existed in the sculpture. And this clearly references the earlier building of the Pantheon. And in some ways you could almost say that it's also influenced by Palladio, who we studied earlier with the Villa Rotunda and some of the other buildings that he built, where he's looking at the architect from the first century, Vitruvius's ideas, and Palladio had republished this stuff. So classicism has its handprint all over all of the buildings of Europe at this point in time. And in particular, Palladian architecture dovetails very nicely, it coincides very nicely with the neoclassical movement in terms of painting and in terms of the decorative arts. And so because Palladio's, um, his treatise and his republishing of Vitruvius's uh, treatises were so popular, they became something that was used by a lot of architects throughout the world. And so there are these examples of pantheon-like buildings that are so similar to the Villa Rotunda that, it, that it's, it's really remarkable. So for instance, in the US, Thomas Jefferson designs Monticello to look just like one of Palladio's houses in a way. But he uses actually sort of inferior materials because he needed to do that because the weather was so bad and he sort of redesigns the windows to make these long, thin, skinny windows. Some people refer to this as Georgian architecture. Um, I think it's Palladian and because of the symmetry and because of all the references to the dome and the central plan. The Chiswick House by uh, Lord Robinson, um, you know, is really uh, another remarkable building that takes up a lot of Palladio's ideas and uses classical references in architecture um, to really kind of make a temple to the people who live there. So if you think about it, the use of classicism is a, is a form of propaganda and you can use it to say who you are, that you are important enough to understand classical education, that you understand all of the good um, antique things from the past and that you are going to reuse them in contemporary architecture from the 1700s. Now, some of the classicizing references that I was telling you about really pertain to cultural education and industrialization, and this kind of comes together in this phase. What I'm suggesting to you is that people who lived especially in England and in France in the 1700s would take something called the Grand Tour, and they would literally visit every single classical site that they could get to. And often the classical tour would take them through Italy, France, and then to Greece. And, you know, Greece was being controlled at this point in time, actually by the Turkish Empire, 
Uh, and you could go and visit the Parthenon, but it was kind of a sealed little city. But a lot of people would go and try to look at as many classical things in Italy and in Greece as they possibly could. One of the other things is that people who were educated, in, especially in the British um, system of education, were expected to read Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey, and read texts that were uh, Plato's Republic and stuff like that, and be really versed with all of that text. So that would mean that they would really have a sort of affection and an understanding of the classical world, and particularly of the poet Homer from the 8th century BCE. Now, the other thing that's going on at this point in time is industrialization, and Josiah Wedgwood had a factory in which he was making lots of pottery. And so this pottery is referencing a kind of jewelry called cameo jewelry, in which you take a shell and you carve out the background and you leave the white mother of pearl, and you can actually make a piece of a little brooch out of it with a profile. And he's doing this in ceramics. With industrialization, every year things change very rapidly. People want new styles, and Wedgwood is, is making basically new stuff every couple of years. And it also has to coincide with the tastes of that time period. So what Wedgwood is doing here is he's making a reference to classicism, but this is not like any vase you would ever see from the classical world. But they would have understood how it referenced relief sculpture because of the way that it's, it's designed. It, it's also what's called an apotheosis that shows Homer with his harp stepping up on a block, which basically means he's being crowned. And on the right-hand side is a Nike figure, which is a winged victory figure that shows that he is victorious as a sort of um, classical figure who has become a, uh, a father of poetry and the father of Western and European culture. Det her det er et vigtigt billede for mig. Det er et historiemaleri, det vil sige, at man indkapsler en hel historie i et snapshot, altså i et billede. Det er Rubens, der har malet Salomons dom, og øh, historien er den, at de her to damer, hver har født et barn. Og det ene er død meget kort efter fødslen, den ligger hernede, og det andet er sprællevende. Vi kan ikke blive enige om, hvem der egentlig er øh, mor til det levende barn. Og derfor går de op til den kloge konge. Han bliver så spurgt om, hvem skal have barnet, og han siger til bødlen, det kan vi altså ikke afgøre på den måde, vi kan få et halvt levende barn, og han bliver altså bødlen om at flække barnet. Det der så sker, det er, at den rigtige mor, vi kan se, at det er den rigtige mor, fordi Ruben så i klæder hende, det gyldne barn. Hun bønfærer kongen, nej, for guds skyld, det er værd med at flække barnet, giv det heller til den anden for bødskab. Og det er som om, at kongen godt har vidst det her, for hvis vi kigger på bødlens øjne, så retter han opmærksomheden over på kongen. Det er som om, de har lavet en aftale inden. De siger, det kan godt være, at jeg siger til dig, at du skal plække barnet, men vent nu lidt. Lad os nu lige se, om der ikke sker noget. En øh, rigtig god historie, fortalt på en meget overbevisning.
we started working in, um, in Kalimantan, which is uh, in, in Borneo. So we spent two full seasons there, but it's very, very, very remote. So we have to go in the jungle for weeks at the time. We know exactly where to go, but there's, there's lots and lots of caves that we're not exploring. You know? So sometimes we just go off track, and then we found that another cave with paintings, so it's just everywhere. What we found in, uh, in Kalimantan is we found the same kind of style of, uh, of like uh, cave painting, or like animal painting. So large mammals, of course, it's not the same animals, and then but they're painted in the same style, so really large bodies round body and small legs and uh, we were able to date one of them and the minimum age is uh, 40,000 so it's it's about 5,000 years at least older than the one in Sulawesi. There's also uh, human instances that, that we dated. I think the oldest one is about 37 or 38,000 but also as, uh, one of the most important discoveries of that paper is that we show that there's more than one style of cave paintings there. So we have and, and, and when you look at all of the cave, they always superimpose on top of each other. So what we have actually is a first style of camping, cave painting, which is red hand stencils and large animal paintings. And after that, on top of it, we have another style of painting, which is more purple, like mulberry color. And what we were able to date it, so we were able to have minimum and maximum days. So for the first phase, we know that it was made between, it started to be made between 40 and 50,000, maybe 40 and 52,000. But then we have a second phase of the rock art that was made between about 20 and 21,000. So this is right at what we call the LGM, the last creation maximum. So it looks like there was a transition from depicting the animal world to the human world. And it's interesting because I think we have the same thing in, in Europe. So there's different styles of rock art in Pleistocene in Europe. So it seems like we have the same thing in, in Southeast Asia, like at, at the opposite side of the world.